If you're suffering, you're obligated, in a sense, to hold on to whatever ropes someone throws you. Life can be meaningful enough to justify its suffering. You can tyrannize yourself into doing something, but I wouldn't recommend it. What I would recommend is that you ask yourself, what are you willing to do? It's really effective technique. That's when life is worthwhile. I don't know exactly what's going to help you, but don't arbitrarily throw out any possibilities because you might not have that luxury. Antidepressants help a lot of people and there are technical reasons why that's the case. If you're offered a gift by your society and it works, try it. I don't care what your presumptions are. The time you see people who are suffering with depression, for example, that's multiple of reason and I'll take the common reason. You could think about it as associated with the story of Peter Pan. Peter Pan is someone who won't grow up right now. The problem with Peter Pan is he gets to be king, but the king of Neverland. Neverland doesn't exist, so being a king of nothing is not that helpful. Well, one of the things that I often see with people who suffer from depression, that I'm not making a blanket statement about the case of depression because there is lots of them, is that people who don't have enough order in the life tend to go and get overwhelmed. So for example, if someone comes in to me to see me and they say they're depressed, I always ask them a very standard set of questions. Do you have a job? If you don't have a job, you're really in trouble in our society. First of all, your biological rhythm tend to go off the rails right away because there is no reason to go to the bed at a, any particular time and there is no reason to get up. For many people, if, if they do not get up at the same time and they follow the function of their circadian rhythms, that's enough to make them depressed right off the bat. Especially if start napping during the afternoon, they also don't have a purpose. People aren't good without having a purpose. That's a hypothesis I think. We absolutely understand the security that underlines positive emotion. When you're attending to someone you're interested in and you're engaged in, that's when you're alive. That's when life is worthwhile. It's so worthwhile that in those moments, you don't even ask the question about it. The question itself goes away because the meaning that you're united is so powerful that it can push back the adversity that would otherwise characterize life. Nietzsche said the person who has any why can bear any how. We know how it works. Almost all the positive emotion that any of you are likely to experience in your life will not be consequence of attending things. It will be a consequence of things that things are working as you proceed toward the goal you value. That's completely different. You need to know this because people are often they're stunned. For example, they finish their PhD thesis and their presumption if that they're gonna be elated for a month, often instead. They're actually depressed and they think, what the hell? I've been working on this for even seven years and I handed it in. What do I do now? That's what depresses them, right? It is. What do I do now? Well, they're fine if they enjoy pursuing it. As long as it was working out, they get a lot of enthusiasm and excitement out there because that's how our nervous system works. Most of your positive emotion is gold. Pursuit, emotion. If you take drugs like cocaine, the reason they're enjoyable is because they run on the system that help you pursue goals. That's why people like them. So if you don't have a job, you got no structure. That's not good. Plus, you tend out to have a point. So you're overwhelmed by chaotic lack of structure and you don't have any positive emotion. Assuming you want to get better, there is usually something you can figure out that would constitute a step towards some concrete goal. My presumption it's behavioral per per presumption. Fundamentally, that's small accruing gains that repeat are unbelievably powerful. You can tyrannize yourself into doing things, but I wouldn't recommend it. What I would recommend instead is that you ask yourself, what are you willing to do? It's really effective technique. It's like meditative te technique. For example, you can get up in the morning and it's like, and you can think, well, I like to have a good day today and I'd like to go to the bed tonight without feeling guilty because I did do something I said I was going to do and I like to have an interesting day you gotta fulfill my responsibility and I want to enjoy the day they can ask yourself well why would I have to do in order for that to happen that I would do the probability if you practice this for three or five days is your brain will just tell you it'll say well there is that piece of homework that you haven't done for three weeks you should knock that suffer off because it would only takes you ten minutes you've been avoiding 
ads and torturing yourself to death for 72 hours right say well let's figure out what your aims are you gotta have some aims whatever they are they might say well I'm so depressed I don't have any and I say well pick the least objectionable the aims that acted out for a while and see what happens because sometimes you your emotional system are so fold up that you have to pretend you have to act that things out before you can start to believe it life can be meaningful enough to justify its suffering I thought God that's such a good idea idea because it's not optimistic exactly some people will tell you well you can be happy it's like those people are idiots I'm telling you they're idiots there is gonna be things that come along and flatten you so hard you won't believe it and you're not happy then and so if life is to be happy well in those situations what are you doing why even live but life isn't to be happy if you're happy you're probably fortunate and you should enjoy it you should because it's the grace of God so to speak people know when they're doing something meaningful they can tell so why the hell don't they do meaningful things all the time it seems obvious you could do I mean it's hard because other people want you to do other thing it's the struggle but everything that struggle oh I get it I see why I took my about 10 years to figure this out people have a choice choice number one nothing you do mean anything well that's a drag right it's meaninglessness of life and all that existential ignorance that's pain but you outside of nothing that you do is meaningful is you don't have to do anything you've got no responsibilities now you have to suffer things are meaningless but that's a small price to pay the alternative is everything you do matters really if you make a mistake it's a real mistake if you betray someone you tell the world a little more sharply toward evil rather than good it matters what you do well if you buy that then you can have a meaningful life but there is no mocking around it it means responsibility it means that decisions you make are important it means that when you do something wrong it war it's wrong well you want that you know if you take people then you expose them voluntarily to things that they're avoiding and are afraid of and they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals their self-defined goals if you can teach people to stand out in the face of the thing they're afraid of they get stronger and you don't know what the upper to that are because you might ask yourself for 10 years if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do what would you be like well there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time and there are people who do find out over decades long period what they could be like if they were who they were if they spoke their being forward and they get stronger and stronger and stronger and you don't know the limits that we don't know the limits so that probably running about 51% of our capacity something you can think about about this yourself I often ask undergraduates how many hours do you waste or how many hours a week you waste and the classic answer is something like four or six hours a day in sufficient studying watch a thing on YouTube that you not do you want to watch that you do not even care about that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done this probably for our right here you think well that's 25 hour a week it's hundred hour a month that's two and half full week it's half year of work week per year and so if your life isn't everything it could be you could ask yourself well what would happen if I just stop wasting the opportunities that are in front of you you would be who knows how much more efficient 10 times more efficient 20 times more efficient that's the parado distribution you have no idea how efficient efficient people get it's completely it's off the chart it's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path when you say well nihilistic suffer dreadfully because there is no meaning in their life and they will still suffer yeah but the advantage is they have no responsibility so that they pay off and I actually think it's the motivation so well I cannot help being nihilistic all my belief system have collapsed it's like yeah maybe maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because the hell of their easier than acting them out and the price you pay is some meaningless suffering and you can always whine about and people will feel sorry for you if you live pathological life you pathologize your society and if enough people do that that's the hell really really you're asked to outline the place
place you'd like to end up, which is your desired future and also the place that you could end up if you let everything fall apart so that your anxiety chases you and your approach system pull you forward. You're maximizely motivated then. And it's important because otherwise you can be afraid of pursuing the goals that you want to pursue, right? And that's very common. And so then the fear inhibits you as you promise pulls you forward, but it makes you weak because you're afraid. You want to get your fear behind pushing you. So what you want to be is more afraid of pursuing your goal than you are pursuing them. Putting yourself in a challenge mind frame is much easier on your psychophysiologically because you do not get into the generalized stress response to the same degree. You're activating your exploratory and seeking system which are meditated that involve positive emotions. So if you can face something voluntarily rather than having it chase you, it's way better for you psychophysiologically. So the pretty why, well, it's worthwhile to go find dragon and its lair instead of waiting for it to come and eat you. So especially when, and you also add the idea that if you go find the dragon in its flare, you might find it when your baby and instead of full fledged body monster that is identifying and defying going to take you down. Don't avoid small problems that you know are there. Face them because they'll grow into big problems all by themselves and you can think about it. Imagine tax department sends you a notification. You owe them $300. Well, that's annoying. Maybe you do not even want to open the letter or maybe if you do, you just pull on the shelf. But damn thing doesn't just sit there like a piece of paper on the shelf, right? You ignore that for five, six years. It's gonna become attached. All sorts of horrible things. And if you ignore it long enough, you get the idea. It's it's gonna turn into something that is completely unlike the lit little piece of paper that's written on. And maybe many problems in life are like that. You will see that they pop their ugly little head up, you know? And you might want to turn away. You might not want to think about it, which is the easiest way of turning away right you just don't attain to it if you could have your life the way you want it in three or five years if you were taking care of yourself properly that would you want from our friendship why would you from our intimate relationship how would you like to structure your family what do you want for your career how are you gonna use your time outside of your job and how are you gonna regulate your mental and physical health and maybe your drug and alcohol use because that's a good place to sugar down because alcohol for example, out of 5 and to 10 percent of people. So you want to keep the under control and then so maybe you develop a vision of what your life, what you would like your life to be and associate it is so, so the goal. Once the goal is established and you break down the goal into micro processes, then you can implement. The micro processes become rewarding in relationship to their casual association with the goal and that tangles in your incentive reward system and that thing that keeps you moving forward. And the way is work is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can use me moving forward a value goal. Okay, well, what's the implication of that? Better have a value goal because otherwise you cannot get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal in principle, the more the micro process associated with that goal start to take a positive charge. And so what that means, well, you get up in the morning and you will, you are excited about the day. You're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal. Maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you are terrified to fail goal. You do that in some sense as a unique individual. You want to specify goals that make you say, if you could happen as a consequence of my effort, it would clearly be worthwhile because the question always is, why do you do something? Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and do nothing. That's real easy. The question is, why would you ever do anything and the answer is that it has to be because you've determined by some means that's worthwhile number one specify your damn goal because how are you gonna hit something if you're not if you do not what it is that's not gonna happen and often people won't specify their goals too because they do not like to specify condition for failures so if you keep yourself all vague and foggy which is real easy because that's just a matter of not doing as well then you do not know when you fail and people might say well I really 
really don't want to know when I failed because that's painful. So I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you will fail all the same time. You just won't know it until you failed so badly that you're drowned. Okay. So once you get your goal structure set up, you, you think, okay, I could have this life. Look like you might be worth living despite the fact that's gonna be, you know, anxiety and threatening. There is gonna be more suffering and less involved in all that, obviously. The goal is to have a vision for your life such as all things considered that justifies your effort. Okay, so then what do you do? Then you turn down to the micro routine. It's like, okay, well, that's what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? That's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar is like, take a damn ske schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what the rule with the schedule? It's not bloody prison. The first thing that people do wrong, they say, well, I don't like to follow the schedule. It's like, well, what schedule are you setting up? Well, I have to do this. Then I have to do this. Then I have to do this. And then I just go play video games because who wants to do all things because I have to do? It's like wrong. Set the damn schedule up so so that you have the day you want. What's the ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that just like you, you would negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, okay, you got to work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you going to do for me that makes makes it likely that I work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that. Maybe you do an hour of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I do not know. Whatever turns your crank, man. But you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you want to care for. Then you would like to be productive and have a goal. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, great. And you were useless and horrible and you will probably only hit it with 70 accuracy but beats the hell out of zero and if you hit it even with 50% accuracy another role is well aim for 51% of next week or 50 or half percent for god's sake because you're gonna hit the position where things start to look back positively and spiral you apart and so that one way that you can work on your conscientious is a plane of life and you would like to have other way you do that by having a little conversation with yourself about it if you don't really know who you are because you know what you like you won't do what you're told you won't do what you tell yourself to do you must have noticed that it's like your bad employer and worse boss and both of those work for you you want to do and then when you tell yourself what to do you do not do it anyways you should find yourself and find someone else to be but my point is that you have to understand and you're not your own servant so to speak you're someone that you have to negotiate with and you're someone that you want to present the opportunity of having a good life to and that's hard for people because you do not like themselves very much and so so they're always cracking the whip and procrastinating and cracking the whip and then procrastinating it's like god it's boring and such a pathetic way of spending your time and you know what that's like because you probably waste six hours a day and i think i did an economic calculation about that while back your time is probably worth 50 bucks an hour sometimes like that i mean you're not getting paid that you know but you're young and so this is investment time and what do you know is gonna multiply its effects in the future so let's say it's 50 bucks an hour which is perfectly reasonable so if you waste six hours a day and you are then you're wasting about two thousand dollar a week about hundred thousand a year and so go ahead but that's what it's costing you every hour and you need to know what your damn time is worth so let's say it's not about 50 bucks it's 30 whatever however maybe it's hundred it's somewhere in that range one other thing you should be asking yourself is when you spend an hour was that well what have I paid someone 50 bucks to have had that hour and the answer is no it's like well maybe you should do something else with your time and it depends on whether or not you think about your time is worthwhile but the funny thing about not assuming that is if you assume your time isn't worthwhile what happens is you do not just sit around randomly in a state of responsibility list bliss what you do is your suffer existentiality and so that seems like a stupid solution imagine someone that you treat well that you love then try to treat yourself that way you gotta detach from person a bit you gotta think well i'm a person among other people and i do 
deserve at least as much respect as a person among other people. And I should be trying to help myself across time. Instead of being self-contemptuousness and self-destructive, I need to take care of myself as if I'm potentially valuable and lay out my life that way and so that what that character is about. They do not take care of themselves as well as they should. And I don't mean take care of yourself. I mean, that's what I mean. It's like, it's like moralistic att attack. It's like, it's an encouragement to give yourself a bit of benefits of doubt. Take care of your room, take care of your things. Have some respect for yourself. It's like you are. There is a lot of potential within you. And there are many things that you could do and you're necessary. You're necessary more than you think to unfolding of things. If you make a bunch of bad decisions, things get worse not just for you things get worse and so it matters what you do so part of what you do is you want to treat yourself as if what you do matters and so you want to have some respect for my, yourself young people like to think about ways to change the world right and that's actually a positive part of their development and a stage that a development psychologist Jane Piaget called messianic stage and he associated with late adolescence while young people want to change the world the problem is that that's being harnessed into attempt to change other people but that's not what you should do if you want to change the world you should change yourself in a sense that alexander solzhenitsyn said when you analyze the soviet union he said don't be thinking that the line that divides good from evil runs down a political spectrum and countries or something like that it runs down right down the middle of your soul and if you want to sort out the world then what do you do is you sort yourself out it's serious business let's say it's more difficult to roll yourself than to roll steady because you're complicated and there are are horrible monsters inside you that need to be tamed and to be brought into alignment and succession so that you can be powerful and useful person instead of rushing out their no change by the world changing other bad people they should look inward and short themselves out properly and if you have a memory that's more than 18 months old approximately and when you pull the memory up to mind if you still have an emotional reaction that means you haven't fully articulated the memory you haven't analyzed it actually casually you haven't freed someone from its grasp and you're carrying it like a weight and your brain responds to that the more weight you're carrying life that more baggage let's say the more of the stress hormones cortisol your brain produces and the cortisol make you old divide your life into six epochs and then divide each of those that might be say birth to kinder garden and maybe elementary school and then maybe junior high school however you want to do it and then you write about emotionally significant events in each of these epochs and then to ascribe your on you and then you have analyzed you did those solution you want might done differently what you might be differently in the future to straighten out your past if you're thinking about your past what it means is you haven't analyzed the casual changes because you might say well why do you remember your past well you might say well it's order to have an object record of the past it's like it has nothing to do with that there is only one reason you remember the past you that's to be prepared to the future that's why you remember the past and so that you're supposed to do it take the past and extract out from its wisdom and wisdom is the ability to avoid stumbling blindly into ditches here there was a time in my past I stumbled blindly into the horrible ditch and terrible things happened to me you need to take that apart you need to figure out how was it that even conspired with your participation voluntarily and involuntarily necessarily so that the terrible consequence emerged you need to know why that happened and how you could retreat differently in the situation and as soon as you do that the brain will leave it alone it won't obsess you about it anymore because the anxiety producing part of your brain are basically trying to tell you where there are obstacles in your environment not go there there is fire maybe you could master the fire right and you're a wider of fire you're not just a victim lots of situations are dangerous are not dangerous depending on your level of mastery right life is like that and so a negative emotion that's associated with the memory is something that is crying out for a mastery and writing that writing can really help with that you're reorganizing your brain when you write autobiographically imagine emotion memories can be stored in different levels of your brain from revelation imagine written areas that are very emotional of the finally articulated plan for your future life well you want to take everything that's negative and emotional and transform that fully articulated version of your life and then free your of past you shouldn't be thinking about your past i mean maybe if you're 80 and you're gonna over well spend life that's a whole different ways but if you're 30 35 or 20 and most of time you're thinking about your past it's like your soul is trapped back there you need to free it through investigation 
appreciation and the metaphysical language is appreciate because that's in sense what you're doing you're trapped in the past it's like you got to break free of that so you can use all your resources to move ahead into the future